thank you again to come uh, well, with us. And uh, we were talking about some nice stories about what happens because you said it came twice, not only one, and the good luck comes good again. Good luck twice from the same man. Yes. So the first piece of good luck, as I mentioned, is he happened to be on the admissions committee and let me in and actually gave me money to come. Secondly, when I came to the school and I was signing up, I had no economics, so I said, you know, I was just taking the standard what they told me to take. And he looked at that when I came to him, because he happened to be the register guy. Yeah. He said, you take those courses, you're going to be so bored you'll leave. He <laughs> says, go down and take Paul Samuelson's mathematical economics course. I said, I haven't had any economics. And you started That's to, an to work course. with Samuelson. And he said, don't worry, you'll do fine. And so I did. And I had this lovely course, my first term. I had this lovely course with Paul Samuelson, who arguably is one of the oh, greatest you know, economists of, of the 20th century, famous yeah. textbook, but was the first U.S. Nobel Prize winner in economics and in 1970, and, and you know all of those things. And here I was in this class. I learned my economics from the advanced to the basic. And then he asked me to do, you know, he had some work he was doing. He asked me, would I? Uh, check it out, the mathematics and so forth. So of course, being a student, who I said, yes, professor. And I took it home. I worked all night checking it, checking it, checking it, rechecking it. But then trying to make it seem casual, I brought it back to him the next day. I said, yes, I spent some time and I left it with him. <laughs> you know. And apparently it was a good because he then hired me to be his research assistant. And I moved into his office first semester. And I spent, more than and a I year spent the next there. three years ah, three in years. his office. and. We did uh, research together, then I published papers with him. I published papers, my name, not just his assistant. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Merton, um, when, uh, we, we are in Ecuador working a lot about uh, how to improve quality of universities, and teachers of universities are trying to publish because it's very important to publish in, in sure. some uh, very well-known magazines. How you feel to your first uh, article or work that was published and the other thing when you start to teach uh, it's very interesting because a lot of persons that are looking to this program they are teachers and it's very very useful to know how you feel with your first paper published and where your first class well to be strictly uh, correct the first published paper I had I was a, a, a sophomore in college engineering but it was a in English literature, yeah. of all places, the Journal of History of Ideas on Gulliver's Travels. But that was my first publication. Uh, but my first one in economics, uh, you know, it was a very exciting event. And again, I had a passion for this, and the idea that I could and you as do uh, this, like you know, I did it all the time. Good, yeah. I worked on it all the time, but it wasn't work. Uh, and I had, you know, because of this mentor and relationship. Uh, I was free to be able to do things. So the research was very exciting. But I also have a love of teaching. I, from the first time I started teaching, uh, I always put a great deal of effort in it. The truth be is I actually gave them all notes to have and everything to make it easy for the students rather than just walking into a classroom and writing everything on the board and having them copy it, which seemed to me a lot of waste of time. I would hand print small papers this, <laughs> yes. and hand it to the students and then say now you have the things yeah. let's talk uh, and you maintain it yeah, uh, oh, after, I have, after years? I, let's put it this way I have been at this for 40 44 years I am still teaching full-time at MIT I'm still teaching two different courses with the students I still prepare as much as I do I love the students and I love the interaction with them and the rewards any teacher will tell you that they have that good fortune to have a student, and of course it's been so long, many of them have, you know, 30 years ago, to have a student come back and say, because of you or your class with you, that had changed my whole life. It makes a difference. You only need that one to be, make it. And if you had good fortune to have that happen more than once, it's one of the great rewards Feeling, uh, feeling more fulfilling. useful, you've, you've more successful than yes. with any and award? I, I really believe, you know, the role of a university is a store of knowledge, creation of knowledge, which is the research, but the transmission of knowledge, which is education. They're all integrated roles that need to be performed. And the ability to transmit knowledge 
to the next generation, to those who don't have it, you're creating value. You know, when I, we have a student in my our master's in finance program, which is one of our programs. In, and you work a lot with private companies, uh, private like consulting, in chair. Well, well chair I work with private. I've, I've always been involved in the private sector. A little less consulting and more yeah, entrepreneurship. Yeah, but, but, you, but you feel that you are more like realizing like a person teaching oh, yes. I, and I having these uh, uh, classrooms uh, with lots of people both. wishing know, to know. But you see, maybe give it to you another way. I get excitement from change and you know, it stimulates me. So I do the research in academia. Then I go to you know, practice. Different set of people, also very talented and apply the research or do address you know, policy issues or creating new products or solutions. And, uh, and then you, know, you, you go and you do uh, uh, education and training, which is a whole other sort of thing. And, and each of those has got a different, they're connected, but they're all, but the change is stimulating. So it's not, you know, I mean, you understand it? I, I, I feed not, off not each of these. repeating the same things? Yes, like they reinforce always. it. And you know, seeing you know, if, if you can take a student today that comes into our program, because of that particular program, they're relatively young for graduate work. They're 21, 22, 23, typically. I know if I someone comes from Ecuador, for example, and goes in our program, that person comes back, they're going to work for 50 years, a half century. Think of how much value they'll create for themselves and for society. And you were at least part of the process to do that. What a wonderful reward for what uh, you do in it's, life. It's like a seed yet that you, you can see how it grows and it can be not only a, a, a one tree, but a complete forest. Uh, maybe is that the sensation. Um, sometimes people get frustration when they don't get immediately what they want. What happens when, when you present a paper or want to do something and they refuse you? How do you feel about that? Well, you will say, oh my God, I cannot continue with this? Well, first, of course frustration. you feel frustration at the moment, but let me give you an example of a whole area of which I've worked in because it, it, you have to have the patience. I've been very much involved all my professional life in financial innovation, bringing new ideas and new solutions and to, to addressing challenges. And one set of innovations that came out of work that I did with Myron Scholes, or in parallel with Myron Scholes and Fisher Black on derivatives, for which uh, Myron Scholes and I received Nobel Prize. Fisher Black sadly had passed away. Uh, those papers were all done early 70s. That was published in 1973. By 1975, every exchange in the world that was using options was using that technology. So as an example of an innovation come out completely in theory, in concept, in academia. And go to apply it. They went around the world. And by the way, still to today, the same basic methodology and technology is happening four decades later. That's one experience. A year later, I published a paper. One year later, on credit and how you deal with credit risk and bonds and securities and so forth. You know, some of what our crisis has been about credit. Uh, for the next 25 years, the only people to use it were some hedge funds and prop trading desks and a couple other firms. 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. And then it became an instant success. It became a very well-known model. Again, it's used around the world, it still is. So sometimes you have success in two years, and sometimes it takes a quarter century. <laughs> you have to and wait for You it. have to recognize if you want to be people of change, innovation. And it's also true of policymakers. If you want to change the direction and improve things, you have to recognize that's a huge challenge. And even if you know you have something better, it's a great challenge to get that new things done. It's hard to move people. You have to solve problems using not just the mechanics or the mathematics, or the economics even, but you have to deal with the culture. You have to deal with the sociology of it. You have to deal with... Because one thing is on one level, and when you go to the, yes, to the, the real world... the implementation of things new change. things. But talking about this, uh, and, and also finishing this interview, um, I'd like to, to hear uh, something about common sense. 
when um, people is like crazy, world is crazy, crazy financial crisis, uh, things that do you think that are um, uh, online that are uh, really working on, finally they, they don't work. What do you think about what's happening with the humanity? I know that your, your expertise is in economics, but economics has to do a lot with real life. What of we course. can do, how how world is moving on. Well, um, I think I'm inherently a cautious optimist. And, you know, one can tell Good. dire things. Uh, and there are always challenges. And again, having lived life through some very big crises, uh, you know, if you survive them, you become a little more calm that you may well survive them again, even when they seem uh, beyond development. But I think that you, you need to, to recognize that uh, uh, the term common sense one has to be very, very careful about. Because many times what people think makes common sense actually is wrong. Like environmental issues, for no, example? environmental or issues yeah, financial. Or, or financials. And often, uh, you know, so when people say we just need people with common sense, actually you need people who have common sense built on a strong foundation of knowledge. You need common sense. The common sense is, come on, we're dealing with the world, step back, understand it, can you explain it? And when I mentioned communication, I believe that if you really understand your subject, no matter how complicated, you can find a way to communicate it to somebody who's interested in learning it. And so I fundamentally believe all these complexities can be explained to someone who wants to know it, and therefore it's a responsibility to do so. And in that way, build the sense of common sense. What is a mistake is people s oversimplify or make statements that are not based on scientific fact or foundation. But they say it enough, and people say, well, everybody's saying it must be true. I could give you many, Tons many versions of, of this. Yeah. Oh, well, there's many, many examples. I mean, even in terms of the causes of the crises, there were things that were quoted by everyone which turned out didn't even exist or happen. Uh, in my father found in science, people were even, you know, in the physical sciences reporting things that happened that never did. Um, and people heard it and repeated it. And then they said, oh yes, my reference is so-and-so, the New York Times must be true. And it turns out the New York Times got it. And all got traced it's back. A, one person, one person a, said this at some event, and they were wrong. But it got repeated, repeated, and then people didn't go back to the principal source they relied on the source. So the more it's repeated, and this has happened in every crisis in this one. So I would caution, I'm a firm believer in common sense, and I do the most theoretical work, very mathematical work, I, my prizes for that, but always with the idea that represents actually my institution, MIT, that all this work is ultimately its objective is to help society be better. Therefore, you have to have common sense of what really works and why. And that common sense, I, just, I, I fully endorse. Yeah. The, the common other, sense yeah. of pop series, uh, people say things. Probably I think that's is, not common sense. Not good sense. But I want to say one thing, because I know our interview has come to, because I know you said you have teachers and you have parents who are looking at this, you have children. And I want to go back to when I was in high school. And, and when I, after I received the Nobel Prize, I went back to my high school to give a speech. And I wanted to think, who do I speak to? The parents and the grandparents are there. And I said, well, of course, to all the students who did super well, won the awards, most likely to succeed, uh, they, they're fine. But I was thinking of all of the, the, the parents of children who they love and, and respect, and who didn't do quite as well. They did fine, but they, they weren't stars. Often the parents said, oh my God, my child is at the end of high school. That's, if, if he or she hasn't done wonderfully, you know, doesn't look good. Um, those are the ones I spoke to, and I stood out there, I remember well, and I said, Reactions? I, was, I said, I spoke, ran around the track, I played football, I was pretty okay in school, I was not top of my class. In the end, I ended up winning a Nobel Prize. So, don't look at your children just because they haven't super performed. So many people who are voted most likely to succeed, when you follow up, they don't. I don't, you know, so understand, they're particularly in this world of technology and ever longer longevity. High school is early years 
for what people can do. Yeah, but it's, it's very important. It's very yeah, important to debases, understand so. that mm -hmm. can happen. And I know Laureus in chemistry, one, you know, drove a truck after he finished high school and then found it too hard work and went back to school. Another one, a Britter, who won the Nobel Prize in medicine, his dream in life when he was in college was to be the world champion snooker player. <laughs> if you know what snooker is, it's a pool game. Yeah. Uh, and he ended up winning the prize. Nobel no, laureates I found are a bunch uh, of yeah, oddballs. Yeah. It isn't a formula where you go to the best school, you do this. Now, of course, you have to have many good yeah. stimulus, it, it good mentors, and lots of good luck. Extraordinary, extraordinary. What are you going to say to President of Ecuador? How, how are you going to advise in few words? In a few words, I'm going to first listen. Yes. Listen to the issues that he believes are most important for the country and learn from that so that perhaps I can come back again better informed. Excellent. Uh, we, we hope that we are going to have the opportunity to talk again after you have the first impression of Ecuador. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Great uh, pleasure. Regresamos con ustedes.